Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Well, we're starting a new a four-week series. Uh, August is a five-week month, and I guess are all the do months and weeks even matter anymore? I don't know. Somebody introduced me to the term Blur's Day. <laughs> it's another new the new day of the week where I don't know exactly what day it is, but it's. It's a really interesting time, but we are starting a, a four-week talk series, and it's based upon our purpose statement, so I think we can go and bring that up on our screen. The name of our series is called Living on Purpose, and this is the purpose statement that we, Unity of Houston, created about two and a half years ago. Um, for, for now, this community, we've done a lot of work with you know, dozens, if not hundreds of people, contributed to cre creating this statement. In community, we nurture and empower each other transforming our lives that we may serve the world. And every time I read it, I feel more enrolled in, in this purpose. When, when life gets challenging, when unexpected and unwelcome things find their way into our experience, if we don't have a purpose, if we don't have a direction that we are moving, if we don't have a sense of who we are in the world, we can really be tossed about you know, by the wind and the waves. And having a sense of purpose in our lives is so crucial at these times. And this church, would, I mean, really, it has all changed. We went from having a little bit of stuff online to all we're doing is online, like overnight. And I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for this staff and our volunteers. And just, it's been such a, a team effort. Everyone has just jumped in with both feet to get the job done, to do what we need to do so that we can continue to reach our community. And here's the great thing. It's like we're growing our community. Every week we're getting letters and notes and, and financial gifts from people who are far from Houston, who are finding us now. And there's something about the purpose of our community, I believe, which is radiating. And people whose souls are of a similar uh, manner and shape are lighting up. They're recognizing it. There's a resonance that's happening. And people are finding some purpose awakening within and within themselves. So even though this is our church purpose statement in community, we nurture and empower each other, transforming our lives that we may serve the world, I'm using this as the basis for a personal teaching on purpose, how we can use this statement as a, as a, a grid, as a, a framework to begin to pull out some of the timeless principles that no matter where you are, this may not even be your church, but there will be something in this I believe will... will come alive in you to your own sense of purpose. And if you already know what your purpose is, it can deepen. And it will evolve. Your understanding of who and what you are in the world and what God has called you to do will evolve with time and with the need that the world around you is presenting. So I'm pretty excited about it. And uh, I have been told that some people are missing my jokes. <laughs> so we've been talking about the, the, the pandemic. And do you know about COVID brain? Have you heard about this? It's a thing that has nothing to do with having the virus. It's just everything is so off in the world that we're distracted and forgetful. Well, there's a guy named Bill, and he, he was having the same kind of distractibility and, you know, sort of forgetfulness, but it was really because he had retired, and he no longer had his 9-to-5 schedule. He was hanging around the house a lot to his wife's disappointment, and he was really having trouble remembering things, so he, he found a book, and he was sharing it with his friend Sam. He said, Sam, this book is great. It's teaching me that if I could just get a, like a, a device, like an image, then I could remember the things I'm tending to forget. And Sam said, Bill, man, that's amazing. Can you tell me the name of the book? He said, yes. What's that, that flower? It's red, has a really beautiful aroma, and people give it at Valentine's Day. And Sam said, a rose? Yeah, rose. What's the name of that book that I've been reading? Isn't that good? 
<laughs> I hope you enjoyed that joke. <laughs> Thank you, singers, for laughing at my joke. I've told that one before, just shifted a little bit. I do believe that it is important that we, um, we welcome what's, what's coming, that we may laugh and cry in the same day and in the same hour and in the same minute at this time. But we are, our job is to stay open to what's within us and how what is within us is being asked to present and to serve that which is without. So there are three points, as there always are, to Michael Gott's sermon. I was trained well. I'm going to talk about how we are created for connection. And then I'm going to talk about how community is a, a laboratory for the spiritual principles of giving and receiving. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about, what am I going to talk about third? Oh, yes, that now is a time, a great time for community, even though we are isolated. Back in February, we did our Black History Month celebration, and our title then was The Beloved Community, which is a phrase that Reverend, Doc, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King, I guess he was a doctor too, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about, and that, it's, that the beloved community is the, the way that a conscious evolution in humanity will occur. And Thich Nhat Hanh, the wonderful Nobel Peace Prize winning Buddhist monk from Vietnam, said it this way, 2,500 years ago, Shakyamani Buddha proclaimed that the next Buddha would be named Maitreya, the Buddha of love. I think Maitreya Buddha will be a, may be a community and not just an individual. A good community is needed to help us resist the unwholesome ways of our time. Mindful living protects us and helps us go in the direction of peace. With the support of friends in the practice, Peace has a chance. Are we witnessing any unwholesome ways in humanity right now, the time we live in? Are we seeing um, anger and cruelty? Are we seeing dysfunction in our collective consciousness? Um, if you're not on Facebook, you may not be, but if you are, you might be seeing some of that, or in the news, it's out there. And what what Thich Nhat Hanh is saying is that this prediction that the, the Buddha will reincarnate, re, the, the next reincarnation of the Buddha will be the Buddha of love. And I love this idea that it will not be reincarnated as an individual, but as a community that embodies peace and love and compassion. And what Thich Nhat Hanh says is that this community of peace and of practice will help us in these times become who we are meant to be individually. That each of us can step into the truth of our being more easily, more readily when we have people around us to remind us when we forget. And we all forget. I, I forgot last Thursday what I was and what I, who I was supposed to be. And Karen Tudor reminded me. See the way it works? That's community. Now, I know it's kind of strange to talk about, and so I forgot to say that my title today is In Community. I'm taking a part of our purpose statement for each of the four weeks, and it was kind of strange to talk about community in a time where we're shut down. But it feels right because we are finding ways to connect in this time, and the isolation that many of us are feeling is a call it's a reminder of how much we truly need each other to be the best that we can be. In the Hebrew scriptures, right at the beginning of the ancient story, in the creation story when God had created the heavens and the earth and spoke light into existence, in chapter 2, God created man, breathed life into mankind and then chapter 28 of verse chapter two, verse 28 of chapter 2 and the Lord God said it is not good for man to be alone I will make a helper suitable for him and if you don't remember the next thing that happens is not Eve <laughs> the next thing that happens is the animals and Adam is called to name the animals and then God said, you know, it's still, this isn't, these are not suitable companions for this one made in my image and likeness. And so Adam went to sleep 
God pulled forth the rib, created woman as uh, support and companion. Now, here's the thing about this story. If we're reading it from our um, equality mind of gender roles from the 21st century and, and then we block ourselves from any other possible deeper truth, we're only robbing ourselves of the joy of these ancient teachings. This is metaphysical Bible that we're talking about. This is, there is great truth here that, that God made humanity in its own image and likeness. What is the image and likeness of God? Love, creativity, power, peace, joy. This is the nature. These are the qualities of the divine. We, as a species, as a collective consciousness, are made in that image and likeness. There is a, I want to say a balance, but we can think of it too like a dynamic tension always in spiritual teaching and particularly in our teaching because we are basically um, a teaching of personal responsibility and personal transformation. So the the dynamic tension between the, the personal and the collective is always present in our teaching. And most of our teaching is focused on the individual awakening to their own divinity and stepping forward in power and practice to live the truth of their own being. And there is a deep understanding of our need for each other. That in this creation story, the ancients were tapping into some deep truth that it's not good for man or woman, for Karen or Cindy or Michael to be alone. It's not good. And that helpmates, help, helpers, um, supporters are called into being for a holy purpose. That we may do this work together. And I have shared many times that I, I have experienced salvation in community. That I had this crippling addiction in my life and it was when I sat together in a circle of people who had experienced the same pain and shame and spoke it, that I was freed. Community has saved my life. And that that first uh, New Thought Church that called me in from the bar room that was many years ago there in Dallas, the same thing, that I was carrying this weight of this burden of shame and not enough identity that I, had, I was flawed and faulted in all that I did, and I came into a church like Unity, and someone said, no, that's not who you are. You are the image and likeness of the Most High. And here's a class you might take to help you get in touch with that. And here's some practices you might take up to see how you can retrain your mind, place your thought on a higher vibration, and see what happens. And it was that loving community that remembered for me when I forgot, that lifted me up and that gave me these teachings that transformed my life. Now, I did the work. There's no no one could do that for me. I had to do the forgiveness work. I had to sit my own self in the chair and do the practice. But I did it with the support of people who loved me. And at some point, I became healed enough that then I could turn around and support someone else. And it wasn't that long in my journey. I was still kind of a mess, but I at least had one class. I could at least give my experience about that and say, here's what I'm learning. And truly, that's all we do in spiritual community. We share with each other. This is, this is what I know. This is my experience. This is how it's working for me. And so I want to talk for the second point about the, the giving and the receiving. This is the, the, du- the dual nature of reality. We know that nature is one. God, there's only one presence, one power. But the one becomes two, expresses in polarity. And sometimes we think that there's like a a right and a wrong when there's not a right or a wrong. It's a both and. It's not either or. And Cindy Wigglesworth is the one who gave me this uh, wonderful teaching, the the technique or the, the tool called polarity management. And the way that she taught it to me was this. She said, which is better, inhaling or exhaling? And if you only, ha- if you only could only choose one for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? It's a ridiculous question. And the rest of your life would only be a few minutes, no matter which one you chose. 
that we need the, the beautiful paired opposite of the give and the receive to live and to thrive. And this is a beautiful example of the way life is in many ways, that we both need to receive what we need to breathe in the good of God in community, in financial flow, in health. We need to be able to take it in, the blessings of God. And we also have to give of our good, to give of our time and our talent and our treasure. It's, it's the only way to live. And when we just seek to get, we are we're separating ourselves from the infinite flow of God, the infinite flow of life, of good. And community becomes a place where we get to practice giving and receiving in all kinds of ways. Jamaica, I'm sure there's someplace else you'd rather be on a Sunday morning. But here she is looking cute in those heels and that dress, singing for us because she wants to give her gift. Right? She's, I embarrassed her. <laughs> her mom doesn't mind. But that's really, it's just, it's the right thing to do. And then when we give, we are made more. It's like this crazy, like magical thing that happens. Like it's really Jesus and the loaves and the fishes. That when we give of what we are, we are not diminished. We are expanded. We are more than we knew. There is a, a movement between focus on self and doing the work of our own self and giving in support of the whole. And spiral dynamics is a wonderful map of understanding the evolution of human consciousness. And one of the cool things about that, that, that map is that between each level, one will be focused more on the individual, the next will be focused more on the collective. And there is a gentle movement, well, maybe not, not gentle, but there is a movement between the two. And what I'm coming to see is that we're moving into a time where the collective is needing to be our focus, where we need to take care of each other in a deeper and more um, committed, loving, compassionate way. We're seeing it. It's been showing up in our church, I don't know, about eight years ago, maybe, a few of our members said, you know, we're really not doing enough to support the, the people of Houston. And so just a few individuals in this church said we would like to start a, a work in Unity of Houston to support the city. And Unity in the community was born. Now, how many thousands of people have, have, have food in their homes because of this group of people? How many kids have had uniforms and clothes and shoes to wear to school? Because of these people. How many people have been given the gift? Because a few people in our community say we need to think more than just about ourselves. And there's something too about knowing that we're healed enough to help other people. That gives us a more elevated, a more right understanding of who we are as individuals. You know, there's that, that old saying I think I've shared here before. I thought it was just my friend at my AA group where I sobered up and said it, but I understand it's a thing in AA. said, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. <laughs> and that is a common thing. When the ego is running the show, I will think, I'm not very much. I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm not this. I'm not that. But I'm all I think about. And that is an unhealthy focus on the individual, on the self. And by stepping into service, even in small or large ways, we remind ourselves of who we really are. And we are expanded into that. And it really, this is, this is really the beauty of this thing. That even though we may not feel like we have much to give, if we give of our time, of our kindness, of our attention we will find that not only have we helped somebody else in need, but we're better. And some of our false identity has slipped away. There are so many stories of the, all the ancient stories about humankind. It's people who don't know who they are. 
And then a divine messenger comes in and says, this is who you really, you really are the son of Zeus. You really are a wizard, Harry Potter. You really are the, the king. You know, these, these kinds of stories are so prevalent in every culture. Every culture has many of these stories. And you know why? Because it's true for all of us. We don't know who we are. We've forgotten the truth of our being. We're living in that little cupboard under the stairs because we think that we're unloved and unwanted. That's a Harry Potter reference for those of you who don't know. And the messages. Do you remember that scene? If you haven't read the books or seen the movie, it's really cool. On, I think it's his 10th birthday. He's, it's the time they go to Hogwarts and the letters start coming in the house. And even though his family, his uh, aunt and uncle who have adopted him they they don't want anything to do with this so they try to hide all but the they keep coming in they come in the chimney they come through the windows this is the way it works the messages will keep coming to you to remind you no you're not that you're more you're more in community to be in a community where other people are on a similar trajectory I, I'm not much but I'm going to give of what I have to help the whole, we will rise together. And finally, I want to talk about particularly this time. And I was telling Karen and David before the, the service today that it seems like a strange time to talk about community. In community. That we have chosen as our purpose, these are the first two words. Here it is. This is what we're about in community. That's the container we're building. We teach unity principles in community. We serve the city of Houston in community. We sing in community. We pray in community. We meditate in community. It's the container. And at this time when we are so isolated and there are so many people who are struggling with that right now, if you have physical touch as one of your love languages, God bless you. And particularly if you live alone, this is a hard time. There's just no way about it. I mean, I'm hearing from people, from you, many of you in our church, that are lonely, lonely, lonely right now. And so what I'm going to ask us to do is to let that hurt remind us of the wholeness. That this time of isolation and distancing is to remind us how much we need each other. And I also want to remind us all that this, this act of keeping our distance is a beautiful act of service. That we are keeping each other healthy this way. So in, in essence, by staying apart, we are coming together in a new way. There is a, a great need for us to give of our time and our energy right now that particularly, I, I know that this is an election year and I, we do not endorse candidates. We have a very clear understanding that we, that's not our role. We do not take a, a public stand on who to vote for. We never will at Unity of Houston. And we will tell you, it, vote, register, vote. Use your voice, use your individualized expression of God's power to make the change you want to see in this world. And that's the system that we are using currently. I don't know if you know this, but our poll workers are almost entirely retired people, the people most vulnerable to this virus. And so there is a great concern that we will not have enough volunteers. Some of you now have a little bit more flex in your schedule. I'm going to invite you to consider volunteering. If you're younger, if you're healthy, Think about that, that there are maybe other ways that you can step into being of service at this time that you hadn't thought of before. There's a campaign called Power the Polls. We want 250,000 new poll volunteers this year. Think about that. You may be a part of the solution, a part of the transformation of consciousness here in our country by doing that. There are other ways you can serve even while you're still in this isolated place. But I want us mostly right now, while we can't come together, to just be working on our thinking. Richard Rohr, the wonderful Catholic priest who founded the Center for Action and Contemplation, he wrote a book called Falling Upward. And in that book, he talks about the first half of life and the second half of life. The first half of life is about building the structures. It's the householder phase in Buddhism. It's about doing what we need to do just to sur survive and succeed in this world. But there comes a point when we begin to think about what's the meaning. 
He describes that the first half of life is the container. The second half of life is what's inside it. What's the purpose? Why am I here? Why are we here? In community, we nurture and empower each other, transforming our lives that we may serve the world. There is a gift that only you can bring. There is a giftedness in you that no one else has. Are you willing? I know it's easy to lose hope. I keep talking about that in this community, it's time for us to really begin thinking generationally. That we have to be thinking about what we need to create, who we need to become to be welcoming of the young adults and young families who are out there right now. And I'm asking all of us to join in this visioning that we begin to see that, that there is a new generation of Unity of Houston members and students and teachers and ministers. And we need to think about what we want to be to call them in. And really what I'm talking about today is hope. In a time of great disruption, it's easy to lose hope. But if we have this purpose, this sense like God has me here for a reason, I'm going to keep showing up. E.B. White, the great um, writer, Charlotte's Web, so that's the book that I knew him first by. He, he was writing to a friend who was discouraged, and he said this. As long as there is one upright man, as long as there, as there is one compassionate woman, the contagion may spread and the scene is not desolate. Hope is the thing that is left to us in a bad time. I shall get up Sunday morning and wind the clock as a contribution to order and steadfastness. Sailors have an expression about the weather. They say the weather is a great bluffer. I guess the same is true of human society. Things can look dark and then a break shows in the clouds and all is changed. And sometimes rather suddenly. It's quite obvious that the human race has made a mess of life on this planet. But as a people we probably harbor seeds of goodness that have lain for a long time waiting to sprout when the conditions are right. Humankind's curiosity, relentless, relentlessness, inventiveness, ingenuity have led us into deep trouble. We can only hope that these same traits will enable us to claw our way out. Hang on to your hat. Hang on to your hope. And wind the clock, for tomorrow is another day. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.